Well, blessed feast. Blessed feast. In many ways, we could say blessed feast. There's uh, three commemorations today that uh, are all intertwined in the liturgical texts in Orthros and in liturgy. We, of course, have the Sunday feast, which is the feast of the resurrection. Every Sunday is a feast of the resurrection. We have the feast of the four, the Sunday before the veneration of the Holy Cross, which will take place on Saturday this coming week. And then, of course, today we have the feast of the Nativity of the Theotokos, the Never Virgin Mary. It's interesting that despite the fact that this Sunday is the direct feast of the, uh, of the Nativity of the Theotokos, which is why we're dressed in blue, why the icon of the Nativity of the Theotokos is out in the middle of the church, uh, despite that, the Epistle and Gospel are still the ones for the Feast of the Cross. You see what a, what a high position the uh, symbol of the cross has in the church and what it means for us. You know, cultures, cultures ideally are built on ideals. Whenever you see a historical culture, whenever a country is founded, it's founded with certain ideals leading it. There are certain principles of how the founders of that country believe the world works and how man ought to function in that world and what he ought to be led by and what his life ought to be led towards. What should we lead our life towards? So this very country, of course, was founded on particular ideals. There were ideals about self-governance. There were ideals about rights that are given not by man but by God. And these ideals are what set for the founding of the country. Even Utah, Utah itself was founded based on certain ideas. Utah was founded not when it it was part of the United States, but, you know, it was founded by Mormons. And even if we disagree with some of their ideals and agree with others, the reality is it was still built, it was still founded with certain ideals leading it. There are, in other words, principles of life and ideals that are greater than individual whims. And these are what create cultures. A good culture, even while having disagreements about those ideals within it, still has the idea that those ideals matter, and therefore vigorous discussions about those principles take place. Cultural suicide occurs... When a society and culture is no longer built on true self-sacrificial ideals, but on personal pleasure and what I want over what everyone else wants, this is cultural suicide. I would argue, dear ones, that comfort, convenience, and entertainment have become the trinity of modern anti-ideals. Our society is not so much built on ideals anymore as on anti-ideals. Anti being instead of. Instead of working towards greater common goals, instead of working towards higher principles, instead of finding a life of service, we've built our culture very much around the idea of self-service to our carnal pleasures. Comfort, convenience, and entertainment are what matter to people more than anything today. And these have replaced meaningful lives. It's why we see a people who are so affluent and yet so miserable. The reality is, is comfort, convenience, and entertainment make us weak. They weaken the soul of man. And when the soul of many people are weakened then the culture around us itself is weakened and brittle. When culture around us doesn't engage with true ideals, but instead is committing cultural suicide, like our culture is, those who wish to live for ideals must create miniature societies. Christian churches, this parish itself, is a miniature culture. It's a mini-society. But... Even deeper than that, we seek the society of the heart. The human heart itself becomes the battleground for what we seek to live for. And whatever we seek to live for is what we fill the heart with. And that transforms the heart. 
the heart of the Christian should be in and of itself a culture, a society, a universe of virtue. And this Christian culture in the heart of the Christian is based on sacrifice. It's based on sacrificial service in love. First of Christ, then of our neighbor. These are why these are the two commandments in which all and the law and the prophets can be found. Sacrifice and love for Christ and for neighbor. This is why the cross is the central image of our faith. Because the cross is the greatest example of Christ not only giving us a command for self-sacrificial service and love, but rather giving us the greatest example of it. The cross for us, despite the fact that what happened upon it was horrific, has become a sign of glory and beauty. We find nothing more beautiful in life than the cross. But the cross is something that must be participated in. This is a big mistake that happens in much of Christianity today, where they believe that what Christ did upon the cross is all done and finished, and therefore it just needs to be imputed to us from the outside, and we ourselves have no direct part in it. That's not what St. Paul says in the epistle today. In the epistle from Galatians, he talks about the fact that far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That crucifixion to the world and the world to Paul could not happen unless he himself partook of the cross. And when you read his epistles closely, you see that the ascending of the cross was the very center of his life. His entire life was based in constant sacrificial love towards Christ and towards his fellow citizens. Today, unfortunately... There are many heresies regarding the cross, many false views and other opinions on how we view the cross. One, living here in Salt Lake City, I know many of you are familiar with. It's the idea that the cross is a shame to Christ and a shame to Christianity, and we ought not display it, venerate it, wear it. The cross is a sad thing that should be hidden, which of course goes directly against what St. Paul just said. The second, which comes from certain Protestant circles that believe in what's known as the prosperity gospel, is that the cross is to be avoided because when you suffer, it's a sign that God's favor upon you has been lost. And instead, only when life is going good is God really with you. Despite the fact that we may mock the prosperity gospel, I fear that this mindset is very embedded in many Orthodox Christians today. When life begins to get difficult, they say, where is God? The Orthodox mindset says, when everything is going good and there's no problems in my life, where is God? (laughs) He's not beckoning me to him. The third heresy about the cross is practical. And it's the idea that while the cross may be beneficial... It's simply something that one must get through. The goal is to overcome all of our problems and have no problems whatsoever at the end and to be perfectly fine and then to rest. Rest is for the age to come, not for this life. We view the cross as a temporary thing that we need to either avoid or get over and then live normal life. The Orthodox understanding has always been that the cross is something to be embraced and embraced in this life. We are people of the cross. We live by the cross, in the cross, and through the cross. We live crucified lives because in this, we are, like St. Paul says, crucifying not the true self, but the old self, the old man. We're crucifying the passions And we're crucifying the false love of this world that gets in the way of the love of Christ. This is why we embrace the cross. When we embrace the cross, we see that what's really being crucified, if we endure properly, are all the false aspects of our life. The transient things. 
the things that will always be disappointments. We seek to crucify the very things that this world holds up against the original ideals of this country. We crucify our constant comfort, constant convenience, and constant entertainment. How do we do this without becoming embittered? This is one of the most important questions we can ask, because as Orthodox Christians, when people hear, especially when they're new to the faith, that we embrace this idea of the cross, they think that we're embracing a masochistic way of living, that we simply enjoy our misery. But for the Orthodox Christian, that sacrifice on the cross is not miserable, but rather there's a deeper joy embedded in it. Why? Because the way that we endure our cross is by making it an offering. We understand that every cross we endure, if we're self-focused, is misery. But if we're focused on perfect love and service of Christ and neighbor, it becomes an opportunity and a joy. And in fact, the more opportunity we have to sacrifice for Christ and others, the more joyful we are. Christian culture is based on crucified living, on not just bearing a cross, but taking up the cross. Not just taking up the cross, but willingly and eagerly lifting it up. And not just willingly lifting it up, but taking it up with joy. This is Christian culture. This is the culture that we hope to see around us, but first must be embedded in our own hearts. The joy we find is in what we offer and making that offering a living sacrifice to Christ and to one another. This is what brings peace of heart. The things of this world that promise peace of heart are always lies. And they always make man unsettled, broken, confused, miserable. But true sacrifice out of love brings peace. If we seek true cultural change around us, we cannot bring what we don't have. And the only way to bring to others the kingdom of grace is to have it embedded within the heart first, which means to embrace this ideal of joyful sacrifice for Christ and others. If we don't have that joyful sacrifice, but rather complain in the cross, that complaining is a message It's a message that we've rejected the joy of the cross and its power to crucify the old man, the passions, and the world. It's a message that we've decided to be self-focused in our Christian living. And in rejecting the gratitude and joy that we ought to have with the crosses which meet us, forgive me, but what we're really doing is rejecting our very Christian identity. One cannot be a Christian who complains, whines, moans, and becomes more self-focused every time things in life become a little difficult. It simply doesn't work. But if we're to live the cross like the apostles, when we take up crosses, we will do so joyfully. And in fact, when the world doesn't provide us crosses, we will voluntarily take up our own. This is where we increase our fasting, our prayers, our prostrations, our almsgiving, simply out of love for Christ. Because the heart bursts forth, and it seeks opportunities to sacrifice. It seeks opportunities to be crucified to this world. Think of the greatest examples of the Christian faith among us, the monastics. You can't find Orthodox monastics who are striving for virtue and being sanctified, who center a single second of their day around self-comfort, convenience, and entertainment. Rather, you see them constantly crucify these things left and right, up and down, every opportunity they get with a big smile on their face. And what do they have within? Peace. You don't see people miserable and confused. You see people settled whose minds are not darting all over the place, whose emotions aren't leading the charge, who don't struggle with every single activity that comes upon them, 
who don't whine and complain when asked to do things that are above and beyond reasonable expectation. Instead, you find people who are so full of joy, so at peace, so warm, so humble, so loving, and feel the connection with Christ at all times. This is what we desire in the Christian life. If we really desire Christ, we have to see the cross as something which needs to be participated in. This is, again, a message of the gospel of the entire New Testament that I think, sadly and and frankly to me, I get confused about why it gets so lost among many of the heterodox today. That a life in Christ means a life participating in every aspect, not just the joys, but in, again, his persecution and his crucifixion. And that if we seek the resurrection with Christ, we too must be crucified with him. What do the apostles say about this? It is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. If the tribulations are the path to salvation, then why in the world would we reject them with complaint and ingratitude? If this is the way to salvation and union with Christ, then we ought to joyfully embrace and venerate the cross of our Lord when he brings us a tiny splinter of it. Today, of course, in commemorating the nativity of the Theotokos, we're commemorating the birth of one who embraced a life of service throughout her entire life. When we look at the Panagia, what we ought to see is first and foremost an image of one who absolutely had no will of her own, but one who constantly sacrificed and crucified any inkling of egoism that might pop up so that everything she did, everything she thought, everything she said could be pleasing unto our Lord. And after our Lord ascended, she took that ministry and ministered unto the apostles until her own repose. Today we commemorate the birth of one who lived a constantly crucified life. She becomes a model for us on how we too ought to live. Dear ones, may we present to the world a Christian culture through crucified living that joyfully sacrifices for Christ and joyfully sacrifices for our neighbor, constantly seeking the prayers of the Panagia, the perfect model of this crucified life for us. Amen.